Hello, welcome to today's webinars about optimizing LoRa or LoRaWAN designs. We presenting this together. Uh, I have invited one of our experts in LoRa design and testing, Nassif Mahmoud. Hello. And myself, Jörg Höpp. Let's start a little bit um, about LoRa, LoRaWAN, and especially low power WAN, LoRaWAN one of the low power WAN technologies. What are the typical use cases? I was a little bit looking in the internet what people are thinking about how they can use LoRa and found here a um, kind of estimation from NCTA about the US market for LoRa WAN. And here uh, it is quite interesting what kind of use cases they see. They have especially analyzed what is LoRa WAN uh, uh, used for and what is narrowband IoT and other uh, cellular um, uh, low power WAN technology. And the use cases are quite similar. And for this purpose, I have just selected uh, what LoRa WAN is used for. And for example, one prominent application is street lighting, everything in agriculture and the main purpose is probably about smart meters in the future. This is a kind of forecast they see here around 40 million LoRaWAN devices for smart metering in the future. So there is a couple of use cases, especially if you need low power consumption uh, IoT devices, especially sensor networks like smart metering. So let's have a quick look on the LoRaWAN technology. Where is this coming from? Uh, the main idea is coming from SHRPS, which is more or less a kind of very old radar technology or radar technique developed in the 1950s for yeah, more or less radars, especially in the defense, for defense applications. And what is the idea? It is, the idea is that you have this kind of linear frequency modulation. That means you are changing the frequency linearly from one point to another over, over a certain bandwidth. This is more or less idea compared to frequency shifting where you have possibly two frequency and you shift from one frequency to the others. Here, a linear sharp. This is the idea of the LoRa modulation developed or owned by Zemtech today. LoRaWAN network architecture, how this looks like. Of course, on the left hand side, you have all kinds of applications of IoT devices, probably smart meters, bicycle, trash cans, suitcases, whatever you would like to use. Then um, your network provider or your as a network provider, you can run your own LoRa network if you, would if you like, have a couple of gateways to get a certain coverage. And if, for example, in this case, a bike would like to send out some message positions or whatever, then all gateways which are able to receive this message will receive this. So they are all looking on air what kind of LoRa signals you can receive and forward this to the so-called network server. Could be here in this case the serving network server or the home network server. Then the network server knows to which application this kind of device belongs to, send this to the related application server. Probably the application server would like to send you an, an um, acknowledgement that you have successfully received this message or in related commands. Then the application uh, server sends this back to the network server and the network server selects based on the information that they have about the coverage and the received uh, power of the different messages, which gateway seems to be best located to this kind of device and only this gateway sends out these messages. This is more or less idea in the architecture of LoRa. You see uh, some other servers like a joint server, which is related um, to security purposes and also to the rooming services. So that is a kind of advanced LoRa architecture where you can also have rooming between different networks. So in a nutshell, how this looks like. Um, we have the spurred, uh, sharped signals that I mentioned before, this frequency, linear frequency modulations on different bandwidths, 125, 250 and 500 kilohertz. Depends always in which countries we are using this, in which band, what is allowed, and so on and so far. As I explained already, you have multiple gateways which are simultaneously receiving this, so you have a kind of spatial redundancy. There is also a kind of pseudo-random frequency hopping. It means, dependent on the channels which are available in this deployment, you can switch between these different channels, um, which is, of course, important to avoid interference. Then you can adapt your data rate based on the actual uh, radio conditions. That means you can play with the spreading factor and also with the bandwidth. And I explain this a little bit later, the different RX modes, uh, what is called in LoRaWAN classes A, B, and C. 
What you see here, as explained briefly already, you have here an object, you have here this uplink and LoRa modulation goes to a couple of gateways. Here you have the network server. Here you have the downlink. And here you see a kind of modulated uh, LoRa signals, which are using these frequency sharps. And you see here how fast the frequency is changing depends on the bandwidth that you are using and the spreading factor. So this is how this looks like. Uh, now coming to this three classes, which are quite important, especially uh, if you are thinking about latency and power consumption. You see this here, this is a latency or responsiveness in this, in this case, and this is what is your mean power consumption. Most important is a class A, and this is for really for, for um, sensor networks. You are transmitting something because you have an event that you would like to report, scheduled or whatever, by an interrupt. You are sending this to the network server, and after a certain delay, the called receiver delay, you are opening the first receiving window. In this time, you are expecting messages from the network. If you are receiving nothing, then after a second delay, you opening a second receiving window. After that, you are going to go in sleep mode, and the network or your application server is not able to reach you again. This is class A. Very low power consumption, but of course, in terms of responsiveness, uh, only the device itself um, uh, decided when it is open for communication. Then you have class B, this is a kind of scheduled communication. That means the device is opening receiving windows, or what is called here, receiving slot from time to time. And for this, they introduce a kind of beaconing because you need a time synchronization between the network and the devices. Otherwise, they never meet each other. And then you have class C, which has of course the highest power consumption because you are more or less always on, you're always able uh, to receive messages from the network if you are not just transmitting. Um, then, most important, there is a LoRa alliance. Odon Schwarz is also a member of this LoRa alliance. And the LoRa alliance um, has, over the last couple of years, were quite successful with a lot of members, is focusing on specifying everything which is necessary for a smooth interworking of LoRa devices. What is defined there? There's essentially defined this MAC layer for LoRa with these three different classes that I described before, A, B, and C. It is used the LoRa modulation. Uh, in some cases, optionally also GFSK modulation, and they described about the supported bands in the different countries. So this is always becoming more and more. You see here for the EU, US, China, Australia, Asia, South Korea, India, Russia, and they are working on more. And here you see a couple of specs which are already available. For example, most important, the lower advanced specification. Uh, for different versions, I think uh, soon is coming out the uh, version 4 for the Laravel specification, the backend interface. Then all the regional parameters are described in a separate uh, specification and then the end device certification. I will come to this later. Looking now, what is important for us if we would like to optimize uh, our IoT devices, especially LoRa devices, and what are the main challenges in the design? Sometimes it looks like that every kit can build a LoRa network, and probably this is true. But there are some challenges. Even if we are talking about very cheap devices, IoT devices, even in LoRaWAN for just some euro, that doesn't mean that quality and reliability is not important. It is important because at the end of the day, we would like to serve probably mission critical, at least business critical applications based on the sensors. Therefore, quality and reliability is also very important also for this kind of devices. Then it is called low power wide area networks. And LoRa is also one of this technology and therefore low power consumption, battery lifetimes of the devices 10 to 15 years is very important and very important to measure this. And then deep coverage. If we would like to deploy this kind of devices more or less everywhere, we have to make sure that we have really a kind of stable connectivity and therefore deep coverage, RF performance are very important. What are the main topics that we see in testing design. There's, of course, a design verification task. RF performance testing, I will come to this later, including antenna design verification and, of course, low power design. These are topics that are very important, which are, you have to verify and optimize in your development process. Then the whole thing about certification. There is a certification 
uh, from the regulators for the different countries because we are operating in the um, unlicensed spectrum, means ISM bands. That means your device has to behave and network friendly because there are other technologies also using the same spectrum. There's also other LoRa devices and so on and so far. You have to think about duty cycle, maximum power and so on and so far. In addition to this, there's also a LoRaWAN certification. The LoRaWAN certification, the main intention firstly is to ensure a smooth interworking of all devices so that you bring it, if you have a LoRa device and this has the certification, it works with all other LoRa devices and gateways together. Then so far we had also a kind of operator certification which was mandatory, but just recently the LoRa Alliance was talking together with the and deciding together with these uh, operators that this kind of um, certification becomes now uh, part of the official LoRa certification process. So this is no longer happened separately, this is part of this. And then of course in production, manufacturing, end of life testing, also very important to check for example the output power, the frequency, receiver sensitivity, at least the essential parameters that you can make sure that the devices that you bring on the market, that you roll out, that this have the quality that you're expecting. Just a quick look on regulator requirements. Just two examples here for the EU, defined by Etsy, here for the North American markets by FCC. Typical requirements, effective related power, power spectrum density, this kind of TX measurement, out of band emissions, duty cycle, and so on and so far. Similar on the FCC side. Um, how you are testing this, what are typical setups in R&D, and if you would like to make a kind of pre-certification testing, you make TX measurements. And this year, typically you are doing with a spectrum analyzer, connecting your, RF, your LoRaWAN DOT to this via an RF cable, sometimes also over the air. Typically you have a testing tool how you can control your DOT, and then you can perform all the different messages. So, this was now a lot of slideware about how to do so, but as I said, I have one of our experts for this here. Nassif, could you show us a little bit how you, we can test this and especially how you can catch the Sherp? Thank you, Jörg. Um, just like you mentioned, um, the LoRa transmitter test is divided in two parts. First part is definitely interesting for R&D customers where, you know, the customers are interested in performing, you know, chip uh, signal analysis by demodulating the signal first. Mm -hmm. um, and for the second part, it's not just interesting for our certification customer because it consists of a compliance and certification testing, but this is also interesting for our R&D customers because they have to qualify and certify their devices in the end. So what we're gonna do is um, first start with the R&D uh, tests. So this is uh, where we try to catch the chirp, as you mentioned. Uh, for that, uh, as you already showed in your slide, the uh, test setup, we have it here as well. So we have our FPL, which is connected to the RF port of our DUT over there. And the FPL is connected to the control computer uh, via the Ethernet port. Uh, we have the VSE, uh, which is the Vector uh, Signal Explorer software. And this is actually um, uh, positioned on our uh, com control computer. The software that we're using is uh, the transient analysis option on the VSE. So this is a special feature that allows us to automatically, you know, uh, analyze, detect, and demodulate chirp signals as well as hop signals, right? The device under test is connected via the USB port to our control computer as well. And this allows us to you know, con configure the DOT. So uh, if we take a look at our uh, software, uh, especially in the spectrum mode, what we see here is that uh, we have uh, configured the FPL to 915 megahertz center frequency and has a span of one megahertz. And what we also set is um, in the trace option from the trace config menu, a max hold and uh, the detector type is positive peak. What we see here is that we have a signal which is of um, 500 kilohertz of bandwidth and uh, we can also check the spectrum flatness. Obviously the DUT has been configured to uh, you know, send out this kind of signal, but people in R&D 
are not just interested in spectrum flatness, obviously that is one of the parameters of interest, but they want to know more about the signal. And for that reason, we have to switch to the software VSE and uh, switch on the transient mode uh, analysis software. As I mentioned before, uh, the transient analysis mode can um, dem demodulate chirp and hop signals automatically. Uh, and uh, if we look at the configuration here, what we have is the same uh, parameters that we set on the normal spectrum mode. But what we uh, have a bit more is the measurement bandwidth. We have cut it down to 650 kilohertz. We have set a, a reference level of uh, 20 dBm. And uh, we can switch on this measurement. And when we do that, what we have is an overview of uh, the entire um, analysis mode of what's going on inside the signal. So we can uh, zoom into different uh, windows here. For example, we have the FM uh, time domain measurement where we can see that we have a signal bandwidth of um, 500 uh, kilohertz. Also, we can choose to zoom into the signal and then we can see the up chirps and the down chirps. Automatically, what happens is that uh, the chirp signals are being uh, detected and that we can take a look when we uh, dive into this uh, chirp results. Obviously, what we see here is a detailed analysis of each individual um, up chirp and down chirp. So there are a lot of parameters uh, that's being uh, detected and measured at the same time. Obviously, not all of these parameters might be of interest to uh, an engineer. Uh, so then uh, it is possible to do another thing, which is you go into the results and you can um, just select the parameters that are of interest for you. And then you'll get not an exhaustive list of you know, measurements that are being performed, but rather a few measurements. There's another thing that uh, I need to focus on, and this is the you know, spectrogram view. Here you get an uh, overview of uh, what's happening above the frequency in time domain. So this is really helpful for R&D engineers, uh, you know, just to um, see if there's something happening out of the ordinary uh, that you might not otherwise uh, notice. And uh, we see another thing, uh, like I mentioned, that the measurement time in this case is uh, set to one second. But if we go down to, let's say, 35 uh, milliseconds, you'd be able to, you know, dive deep inside this uh, chirp signals and, you know, be able to monitor uh, if something, you know, other than the ordinary happens in your chirp signal. So that's basically... Um, how uh, the, the R&D engineers can do the analysis. Obviously, it is possible to you know, export the trace data out of uh, the, the, the software in case uh, the engineer is interested in you know, uh, analyzing uh, this data offline, or it is also quite handy for production tests. OK, thanks, Nassif. Uh, quite amazing how we can catch this curb, finally. Uh, with this kind of instrument. But I mentioned before uh, regulatory requirements. So, and obviously this makes sense also in the RD lab to pre-check this kind of parameters before you are going in a, to a certification lab because this is time consuming cost and so on and so far. Can we do a couple of these measurements as well with this setup? Well, a uh, good point that you mentioned. So according to FCC part uh, 15.247, uh, you already showed a list of measurements that need to be uh, performed. And obviously, these are the functions which somebody uh, in a you know, certification lab needs to program into their code, because I assume that they like to automate the entire test routine since you know, they have to do this over and over again. And this is exactly where the FPL really stands out from the competition, because all of these functions come as native functionality of this instrument, which means we are saving time not just in uh, you know, writing down the codes, because you could just now, in this case, write your automation script by calling in Skippy commands, and then you would be able to use those functions. Mm -hmm. But also, we cut down on the measurement time, 
because the functions being native to this instrument means that we are already performing the measurements on the instrument itself. And we don't have to, you know, uh, export out the IQ data and then make those measurements. Obviously, those are uh, time consuming. Uh, what we then can uh, do is make those measurements on board the instrument and then send the final uh, measurement data out. And so you use, you know, screenshots and whatnot for, for reporting purposes. Um, Sounds cool. Obviously, we can show one of those measurements and then I will take you, because there are a lot of measurements, I'm just going to show one and then take you through the menus and then maybe you'll get a good idea of uh, what is uh, on offer in this instrument. So for this measurement, uh, we have uh, configured our DUT according to uh, the FCC part 15.247 compliance standard. And uh, what we are doing is we are transmitting a signal with 500 kilohertz uh, with a spreading factor of 12. And the output power is set at 20 dB. The frequency is set at uh, anywhere between 902 and uh, 927. Uh, megahertz, we set it at 915 megahertz. Now the FPL has been configured with a resolution bandwidth of 100 kilohertz and a video bandwidth is three times the resolution bandwidth of 300 kilohertz. And this is exactly according to the specification. And now what we need to do is we can uh, go into this uh, marker setting and then go to select marker functionality. And the first measurement that we are performing is the 6 dB bandwidth uh, measurement. And for this, all we need to do is just switch on this measurement mode and uh, mention 6 dB. Now, straight away, we have the measurement which is completed and the result is 646 kilohertz. Now the specification says that uh, in order to pass this measurement, uh, the 6 dB bandwidth needs to be greater than or equal to 500 megahertz. So this one we can see is 646 kilohertz, um, which means it's, it's passing this. Uh, and that was actually the first measurement. And some of the measurements that we already talked about were, uh, you know, band power measurement, where you have to do a power uh, measurement or a power density measurement and these are all options that are already here and uh, just by calling in the skippy commands we are able to you know avail all of this measurement uh, another interesting thing is the occupied bandwidth part where you just uh, you know by the click of a button you're already there you just mention uh, what kind of uh, channel bandwidth you need and uh, all these measurements can be performed by you know very um, minimum effort. And so this makes uh, our measurements quite fast and uh, you know, quite robust when it comes uh, to coding. Thanks, Nassif. So that means with the FPL or with the spectrum analyzer, we can do this, this different kind of pre-certification measurements quite easy. Uh, let's have now a look on some other measurements, which are also very important for this kind of devices on the LoRa certification and also on the X measurements. For this, I would like to switch back to our slides. LoRa WAN certification, what is behind this? Uh, the LoRa WAN certification was defined by the LoRa Alliance. Uh, more or less already with the starting of the LoRa Alliance, uh, people were thinking about if we are specifying all these different Mac layers and so on and so far, it is very important that we make sure that uh, all the devices, gateways can smoothly work, which is our. Therefore, the main task of this uh, LoRa WAN certification is uh, to ensure this interworking. And you see this on this kind of test cases, which are all about the different procedures on the Mac layer in the interworking. The process as such is that there is a couple of LoRa um, authorized uh, test houses. It started at the beginning with LoRa, with IMS and with Atomplan, one in Germany, one in Scandinavia. In the meantime, you see a couple of other test labs which are also allowed to make this kind of LoRa certification. And if you would like to certify your module or your gateway based on the certification process, you have to be member of the LoRa Alliance and then you can go to the test houses and uh, ask them to perform this kind of testes. This is about the Mac layer, but uh, they also recognize that it's not only about of interworking, it's also that people are looking for 
having the really the performance that they are expecting from this kind of technology in the fields. Otherwise, probably somebody is saying, Laura, it doesn't work, or something like this, or they are simply disappointed if they are bringing this on the field. Therefore, for now, there's also included an optional OTR performance testing, which is a kind of RF testing. And just to, to second this, there is a kind of need really to think about the RF performance. It is all about the antenna design and all what is related to the antenna design and to the RF performance. Not only the antenna itself, it's also about the matching network. It is uh, thinking about what happens if I bring my final design in the final housing, what is the impact of the housing from other components on the device and so on and so far. And therefore, we heavily recommend and also some other people, you see here for example, a test set up from Fabian Ferrero, which is also giving some seminars about, like on the Things conference, about this kind of measurements. For example, simple measurements um, with a VNA, where you just measure is your matching network and antenna really working on the right frequency level, have the right power here. Not that you are spending a lot of power just sending. Uh, not sending out in, in, in this frequency where you need it, uh, just producing heat, that really your setup matching network antenna is optimized. And finally, you need this kind of OTR measurements where you can really have a look on the uh, directivity on the antennas and also looking on TX and RX measurements, how your antenna, your final design um, performs from the RF point of views, typical measurements are here TIB and TIS and directivity. And exactly these measurements are now also defined as optional features in the LoRa Alliance certification. You see a typical setup up in, in a kind of chamber where you are able to rotate your device and they define here how to do this. Um, so far, as I mentioned, this is still an, an uh, optional um, feature, but especially LoRa WAN operators uh, asking for this kind of measurements, uh, otherwise they probably will not allow you to operate your devices in this kind of networks. So how this measurement look like? We talked about uh, the TX measurement as, uh, as well, but of course also the receiver tests are very important. Typical measurements are receiver sensitivity measurements. How you are doing this? Uh, you have a signal source where you can hopefully generate some um, uh, in this case, some interferences on a ve vector signal generator where you can generate the LoRa signals. Uh, hopefully, and this is uh, valid for our instruments, you can also play with some impairments and then you can measure how well your LoRa device is able to receive LoRa packages. So you can make some typical uh, packet error measurements and, and play with the different parameters and de um, de define and, and measure your receiver sensitivities. What is this impairment? And if you really would like to see how robust your receiver is um, against some impairments which happens on the air, we can play with some parameters. For example, we have here uh, that you can change the frequency off offset of the LoRa signals like you see here. You change the frequency in one or the other direction. We have also some linear frequency drift. This is a possibility. Uh, you can also have a little bit difference like there's a sine wave uh, frequency drift here over the time. So the frequency is changing here. Or you can also play with some simple timing errors. So this is now shortly explained what this kind of measurements are. But Nassif, probably you can show us how to perform this kind of receiver sensitivity measurements with our setup. Thank you, Jörg. Obviously we can. Um, you obviously described uh, two setups. One was the RSSI measurement and the one with two signal generators that was for the blocking test. What we have here today is uh, to perform the RSSI measurement. And for that, we use the signal generator. This is an SMBV100B signal generator from Roland Schwarz, which is connected from our RF port to the RF port of our device under test uh, in the front uh, bench over there. And uh, what we can do with our signal generator is uh, generate signals with different um, bandwidths, spreading factors. Uh, you could uh, play around with the power level, with the frequency. Uh, we can also do you know, different coding rates, uh, payload sizes, lengths, and whatnot. Uh, obviously, at the end, we're going to see that uh, how to you know, generate signal impairments on our signal and, and check for receiver sensitivity, uh, robustness tests, right? So let's move to the uh, software side of things uh, where we see uh, the, the 
signal generator and the configuration menu of the, the device under test. So here uh, on our screen, what we see is on the right side, we have the graphical user interface of our signal generator. And on the left side of our screen, we have uh, the configuration uh, window of our device under test. So let's start uh, by configuring the device under test. What we want to do is switch our device under test uh, in uh, receiving mode. So that we do by switching the sniffer mode on. And what we are expecting to get is a LoRa signal with a bandwidth of 500 kilohertz, a spreading factor of uh, 7, and a coding rate of 4 by 5. Now let's write the setting in. OK, it should be configured. Now we want to uh, enable the sniffer mode. But before doing that, let's uh, go into the signal generator and see that uh, we are generating exactly that signal. And for that, uh, we need to first go into general. So we see we have a 500 uh, kilohertz bandwidth signal. Uh, here are some details about uh, you know, the idle mode. Uh, I mean, what happens between the frames, uh, frame length, uh, other such parameters. But what's important is that we have the spreading factor set to 7 as uh, configured for the duty. Uh, we have a coding rate of 4 by 5, uh, likewise. And the last thing we need to do is switch on the RF. On the, our device under test, let's start the measurement. And right away, we see that the measurement is being performed. So you notice at the bottom of the window. And what we see here is that uh, we have a frequency of uh, 902 uh, megahertz with a spreading factor of 7, bandwidth of 500 kilohertz, and an RSSI of uh, minus 16. So there's basically a loss there in the cabling. Uh, what we can now do is check what happens if we change all of a sudden, let's say, the bandwidth of the signal. So instead of 500 kilohertz, we send 125 kilohertz. Obviously, our uh, device under test is expecting to get 500 uh, kilohertz, but it's not. And so the receiver cannot receive any more signal. So this is uh, another test uh, what happens. But the moment we switch on to 500 kilohertz bandwidth signal, we see that the measurement is running here. So uh, this is a... Uh, a very simple way to see how um, the RSSI measurement is performed. Uh, next, we want to change uh, the power level. So let's take it down to minus 50 dBm. And we should have uh, right away an effect on the RSSI value, which is being received. And we see here is minus 54 dBm. So the rest of the parameters are quite stable. Um, and this is normally. Um, quite an interesting test for you know people who are doing uh, receiver design or you know gateways uh, designs uh, for them to be able to you know change certain parameters on the fly so i have changed right away the spreading factor for example from uh, spreading factor 7 to 11 and we see that the receiver cannot once again um, receive anything so it's shifting it back to 7 should switch our measurement mode zone again so here once again we have the measurement back running now, like we mentioned before, that um, during real world, uh, you know, RF propagation, what happens is uh, your signal will have a lot of, you know, impairments added to the signal. So you would see, you know, symbol timing errors. Uh, a very common occurrence is the frequency offset that's being added to your signal. And um, to be able to, you know, implement that on your signal to check for receiver robustness is, is very critical. And every good uh, receiver should be able to uh, deal with this kind of, you know, impairments on their signal because this happens all the time, right? But to make it repeatable, uh, it is quite often the case that uh, the signal generators cannot do this. However, our signal generator has this uh, measurement uh, mode implemented in the device and into the option itself. And you could actually implement those uh, impairments on the fly and uh, you could have this... Uh, based on a repeatable uh, manner. So um, let's take a look at the screen again and uh, try to do those uh, signal impairment uh, settings. So uh, if we look on our screen here, 
we can see that uh, the measurement is running. Everything is uh, quite stable, so the receiver has no problem decoding all the signals. But now let's switch on our impairments. Now we haven't configured anything into our signal generator, so let's start off with a symbol timing error of 50 uh, ppm and see what happens on our uh, receiver. So um, if we look at the RSSI value, it drops down for, from uh, what used to be minus 54 dBm to now minus 57 dBm. Uh, the SNR uh, uh, value is, is changing from, let's say, around 6 dB to 7 dB. We can now go back to our signal generator and try to set a frequency offset on the transmit uh, frequency from our signal generator and then check what happens on our receive signal. And um, yeah, it seems that uh, our receiver is uh, quite robust and is able to deal with this kind of changes. Lastly, let's uh, try to put some uh, deviation, frequency deviation in our uh, transmit signal and see what happens. I think our receiver is still doing quite a good job in dealing with it. However, the signal to noise ratio, uh, the value is no longer uh, stable at around six or seven, rather it has dropped down to, let's say, in some cases four dB and uh, you know three dB. We can see that it's, it's not constant at uh, six or seven. So um, here are some of the signal impairments uh, that we can add to our signal. Um, on a you know live LoRa transmit uh, downlink signal, and uh, this is uh, how to perform uh, you know receiver measurements, uh, RSSI as well as receiver robustness measurements. Thank you very much, Masif. Uh, very powerful tool, really to play with the impairment with all the different parameters, and really test out how good your receiver performs. Um, now I think we have missed one of our last aspects, that's power consumption. I mean, we are talking about low power vans, and power consumption is obviously a very important topic, and it becomes more and more complicated to really estimate and measure this and test this. And uh, therefore, let's come back to some slides to motivate this a little bit. I think I have not really to motivate how we, why we need this kind of power consumption measurements. Uh, everyone dealing with this kind of technologies is aware about this. But I would like to talk a little bit about the challenge and if we are thinking about test or measurement or measurement power consumption of th this kind of devices. Let's start with this kind of graph, which shows more or less the kind of class R LoRa a uh, LoRaWAN device, uh, where you have probably implemented a kind of sleep or deep sleep modus, and uh, there is a kind of event coming, probably a measurement from a sensor, then the device is waking up and would like to send it out. Then we have this kind of TX cycle. After this, it goes into a kind of idle, then it is opens and receiving window. In this example, it's receiving nothing, opens the second receiving window, receiving something, and going back in a sleep or in a standby mode. And these are exactly the kind of measurements that you uh, would like to do. And as you already see on this example, we are starting here with one microamp and we're going to probably several hundred milliamps. That means high dynamic range is very important that you can really measure this kind of deep sleep modus, but also the kind of transmission mode. Moreover, you would like to have a look on all the different aspects, which are, for example, the spreading factor, the bandwidth, how many data you would like to transmit, what are the different classes. And if you are thinking really about 10 or 15 years battery lifetime, you have also to look what happens over this lifetime. It is not only that you transmit some data, probably you have also some maintenance task or a firmware update and something like this. So you have to think about all operational situation if you would like to um, estimate the power consumption. Let's have a look on, on the typical setup uh, for this kind of measurements that we would like to recommend. Uh, we would like to recommend to use our scope, here in this kind uh, case, the RTO, together with the power probe that you see here. In this case, with four different channels, that means you can measure uh, current and voltage on, on four different areas which is also very important in, in several cases. For this setup, we are using also a power supply. You can also use your battery or something like this. Um, you can also extend this by the setup that you saw already optionally with a spectrum analyzer and also a signal generator. And I think, Nassif, you have already prepared this kind of setup. Could you show us some of this kind of measurements for low power consumption? All right, George. 
Um, so we have exactly the setup that you just showed. Um, we have the RTO connected with the RTZVC power probes, multi-channel power probes, uh, and they are already connected to our uh, device under test over there. Uh, and uh, we're using the power supply HMC um, 8000 series for, for powering up our device under test. Also during the measurement, what you will see is that the screen of the spectrum analyzer will show that uh, uh, if, if, if the DUT is transmitting a signal, you will see it on the screen. And we are going to send out a gateway downlink signal from our signal generator. So the two parts you have already seen, um, now we are just gonna add on top the power measurement. So let's uh, move to our RTO screen. What we are seeing is the web control of the RTO screen. And here uh, we have configured uh, the RTO to make a measurement for 80 seconds in total. Uh, what we also configured is the fact that we want to measure current and uh, voltage. Uh, I know for a fact that our DUT uh, does a maximum current draw of 100 milliampere, so that's why we scaled it in this fashion. And uh, what we also have is uh, configured a math function for our current uh, and uh, voltage, and then we multiplied it to get the power value. And this uh, trace we have enabled, uh, here you can see the brown one is basically um, doing exactly that. Now the test is set up uh, with the DUT configured in this fashion. First of all, it will uh, start off uh, for the measurement with uh, receive mode on. It will be receiving a signal from our signal generator. And uh, this signal, as it's being received, the DUT has these LEDs which keep on blinking uh, constantly. Uh, then we are gonna uh, leave this measurement on for a few seconds, uh, after which we are going to switch our DUT in um, the idle mode. Uh, at that point, when this mood, uh, mode are being shifted, you will see that there are current spikes, and this is what happens really in your DUT, and this is very important to see that uh, you know, we pick up all those signals. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna leave that idle mode on for a few seconds, then we are going to uh, shift the mode to uh, DUT being able to uh, transmit a few signals, um, and we will uh, also be able to see it on our spectrum analyzer display as this uh, you know, signal is being transmitted from our DUT. And then we're gonna try to end this measurement with uh, going back to the receiving mode on our DUT and then uh, you know, once again, uh, the, the signal being transmitted from our signal generator. Right, so uh, I have done exactly that sequence uh, in terms of measurement and this is what we see right now. So I have, um, the receiver part on, uh, then idle mode, then we transmitted the signal and then we left the receiver part on. So uh, what I also did was I configured the gated measurement and I selected area as well as um, a high measurement just to get uh, you know a power and an uh, area would give you then energy consumption. So what we see is that while we transmitted the signal, we have an ener energy consumption of 6.4 watt second and a uh, power consumption of uh, 370 uh, milliwatts. And you could, uh, in that case, uh, then add, you know, multiple of these uh, gated measurements and then um, basically be able to measure the amount of uh, energy and power you required so during uh, re uh, receiving the signal and uh, what happened during you know idle mode so that kind of stuff and uh, i think uh, with that i would say this was an overview of the you know power consumption or energy consumption measurement uh, as we call it i hand over to you for uh, closing up the webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, Nassif, uh, for this nice demo about power consumption measurements. Let's come now to the final part. Uh, we have not talked about end-of-line testing in manufacturing and production, and then a short summary. Yeah, end-of-line testing in manufacturing is obviously also very important to make sure that uh, your final devices going out to service have the right quality and um, uh, performance. Uh, therefore, also the manufacturer of um, LoRa devices and chipsets are recommending some measurements for manufacturing or production testing. For example, the receiver sensitivity that we so just saw, also sometimes some calibration of RSSI is necessary and also verification of this kind of measurement. And not to forget, transmitter calibration, verification, probably the frequency tolerance. 
We have a dedicated product for manufacturing tests, not only for LoRa. As you can see, they are supporting a couple of technologies, especially also IoT uh, technologies, like LoRa, of course. Zigfox is one example. All kind of Wi-Fi standard, Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, the cellular low-power WAN technologies like narrowband IoT, LTEM, also Zigbee Thread, and some others. So, of course, in manufacturing lines, you have very often the, the need to make uh, several um, tests with several devices and also, in some cases, you have on one device several technologies. You can easily do this with this uh, equipment, with the CMW100, optimized for production testing to make very fast, accurate, and full automated measurements. This to production. To finalize this, um, we have talked about um, RF measurements, especially in um, design, verification, and also for certification. The related product products you have seen uh, vector signal generator and also analyzer, more or less the same in verification. We talked shortly about over-the-air testing with the related um, chambers, um, probably some antenna testing with the VNA, uh, everything about embedded design, the scope not only, for, of course, for power consumption, also for a lot of other measurements, also for standard measurements of interfaces, USB, and so on and so far. With our power probe, probably with the power supply, could be the power supply that we saw today, but also, for example, the NGL200. And in production, you can use our production-optimized uh, signal generator and analyzers, but of course, also the CMW100. You can find a lot more information about LoRa testing and general IoT testing on our webpage. Uh, and you can also find a dedicated um, application note about LoRa testing with the test setup that we just showed you today with a very detailed description. In this sense, we would like to thank you very much and hope this was a useful webinar for your purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.